A very good afternoon, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to the Indian Council of World Affairs. We welcome you for a special lecture on Bangladesh's foreign policy, which will be delivered by Ambassador Shahidul Haq, former Foreign Secretary, People's Republic of Bangladesh, currently occupying the ICCR Bangubundhu Chair at the University of Delhi. The event will be chaired by Ambassador Harshvardhan Shringla, former Foreign Secretary, G20 Chief Coordinator, Government of India. I would request Ambassador Vijay Thakur Singh, Director General, Indian Council of World Affairs, to kindly deliver our opening remarks. Good afternoon. I warmly welcome all the distinguished guests, uh, the heads of mission, members of the diplomatic corps, former Director General of ICW, Ambassador Rajiv Bhatia, and of course, our distinguished panelists and speakers for today. Today's is a special lecture on Bangladesh's foreign policy. And I dare say that I, we could not have more qualified speakers than the two we have today. Ambassador Shahidul Haq, who is the former foreign secretary of Bangladesh and who currently occupies the ICCR Bangla Bandhu chair uh, here at the University of Delhi. And then we have with us Ambassador Harshvardhan Shingla, former Foreign Secretary of India and currently India's G20 Chief Coordinator. He was also the High Commissioner of India to Bangladesh from 2016 to 2019, at the same time when, uh, for, uh, when Ambassador Shahidul Haq was Foreign Secretary in Dhaka. Both of them have significantly contributed to promoting the strong friendship between India and Bangladesh. This lecture is special, significant, uh, for four principal reasons, I would say. First of all, our two countries have just concluded the celebration of the establishment of diplomatic relations. Uh, that was last year when we observed, jointly observed the Maitri Divis in 18 capitals across the world, apart from New Delhi and uh, here in ba and, and, Bang and uh, Dhaka. The joint celebrations actually signify the solidarity that exists between two neighbors and two neighbors who are trusted and close partners. Secondly, this lecture takes place at a time when India is celebrating the 75 years of its independence under the theme Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav. India's foreign policy of strategic autonomy looks at growth and development for all based on Sabka Saat, Sabka Vikas, Sabka Vishwas, which means we are looking at co-prosperity co which can be based on the partnerships that we develop with other countries. And those partnerships are based on common understanding and cooperation. In India, the neighborhood first policy is given, a pri is given pri priority and in that Bangladesh occupies a place of primacy. The third reason why this lecture is special is because Bangladesh has recently concluded the celebrations of the 50 years of its independence. So we are celebrating a nation, a nation which during the 50 years of its existence had shown resilience and laid the foundations of a strong nation state. Bangladesh was created on a vision that was chalked out by Bangra Bandhu, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, who was a charismatic leader and an extraordinary political statesman. And he carved out an independent foreign policy for Bangladesh. The, pleasant, the present leadership led by Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina is ably stirring the country's polity today. Bangladesh therefore looks at a future which is based on the foundation of commendable growth and development that it has achieved. Fourthly, this special lecture takes place just ahead of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's forthcoming visit to New Delhi, which will further strengthen and deepen India's ties with Bangladesh. So we look forward to hearing the views of both the distinguished speakers, Ambassador Shahidul Haq and Ambassador Harshwadhan Shringla, 
they will speak on the future of India Bangladesh relations as and the foreign policy of Bangladesh in a world which is in a flux and where you are seeing cost contestations in so many regions of the world including in the Indo-Pacific a shared space of India and Bangladesh thank you and now I will look forward to our two main speakers speaking today thank you Thank you, ma'am. I would now kindly request Ambassador Harshvardhan Shringla to make his remarks and thereafter chair the event. Good afternoon and namaskar. So let me at the very beginning thank the Indian Council for World Affairs for hosting this uh, talk on Bangladesh's foreign policy. I want to thank, uh, in particular, uh, Director General ICWA Master Vijay Thakur Singh um, in, for not only always unfalteringly choosing topics that are of great interest to uh, the foreign policy and think tank communities. Um, in the last uh, few months alone, we have, uh, I myself have uh, been here at events involving COVID, Africa, the G20, and today, of course, Bangladesh is, is a very topical issue, and I'm very happy that you have chosen to host this uh, uh, talk today. Um, of course, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the others who have contributed to this, uh, specifically Joint Secretary Nutan Mohawar, who has been, used the word very carefully, diligent in getting this event underway. Uh, my greetings also to the ambassadors, members of the diplomatic corps, all of our good friends who are here today. Uh, ambassador Rajiv Bhatia, who has been my uh, ambassador when I was in uh, South Africa. Uh, so many of our other friends who participated actively on India-Bangladesh relations who are here today. Um, there can't be a better person who could speak on Bangladesh's foreign policy, but also on India-Bangladesh relations than my good friend, uh, uh, former Foreign Secretary of Bangladesh, uh, Shahid al Haq, uh, who currently holds, uh, is the head of the Bangabandhu Chair in Delhi University. Uh, Shahid and I, uh, as a matter of full disclosure, I was High Commissioner of India and Bangladesh when he was Foreign Secretary. Um, I think very few people have contributed to this, to this relationship to the extent that he has. I think he has been uh, seminal in many of the um, decisions, the accomplishments that the relationship has uh, undergone in the last few years, and uh, I'm so glad that he is here today. Um, there are a lot of things that we have done together. Some are on the record, many are off the record, so we can't disclose all of them uh, in this August gathering, but it's good to have you here, uh, Shahid. Um, so what is the context of this uh, talk? Uh, the first, of course, is that uh, for both countries, this is an important time. Bangladesh has just commemorated its 50th anniversary of the li its liberation from uh, you know, foreign oppression and genocide. Um, India and Bangladesh have commemorated 50 years of our diplomatic relationship. Uh, this is also the 100th year, 100th birth anniversary of Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, who is the father of the nation of Bangladesh. And of course, uh, it is our 75th anniversary, which we have commemorated a few days ago. And we are looking forward to our Amrit Kal, which is the next 25 years that will take us to our 100th anniversary. Um, we, of course, have to keep in mind that while our relationship has, uh, has been of a duration of 50 years, it's only in the last 10 years, last decade or so, that we have made the most gains. And I would say it's in the last 10 years that we've reali realized the fullest potentials of our relationship. Um, when uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, visited Bangladesh in 2015, soon after he had uh, uh, assumed uh, office uh, as Prime Minister in India, uh, this was when he uh, was, and Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina was signing the historic land boundary agreement. Um, the joint declaration that the two countries issued was known as Notun Prajunmo Naidisha, a new era and uh, a new direction in the relationship. In 2017, when Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina was visiting India, uh, Prime Minister Modi referred to the current state of our stage of our relationship as a Shonali Adhyay, or a golden era in the relationship. 
And I think all of this is not coincidental. It is, it is really reflective of the closeness, uh, both at political, economic, cultural, and the people-to-people -people levels that the two countries have witnessed uh, in the last uh, decade or so. And I think uh, very few uh, neighbors, very few two countries have seen the level of convergence and the level of, I would say, um, accomplishments and achievements uh, that have been recorded in the last 10 years have been quite historic and are a paradigm uh, for many other countries to emulate. Now, uh, what are the some of the uh, decisions that made this possible? Uh, 2008, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina came to power. One of the first things she did was that she expelled uh, the Indian insurgent groups that were operating in Bangladesh, in Bangladesh's territory with impunity. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, her policy of zero tolerance against terrorism uh, sent a signal that uh, uh, you know, both our countries needed peace, needed stability, and uh, that was uh, very, very important for our progress and our development. Uh, India, on its part, extended uh, uh, market, uh, I would say, duty-free market access to Bangladesh uh, under SAFTA provisions. Uh, over a period of time, India also committed close to $10 billion in soft concessional credit to Bangladesh, is Bangladesh for, its own, for its development, but also for the development of connectivity and infrastructure that would uh, facilitate trade uh, between our two countries and movements of people between our two countries. So these are very, very important. And these decisions, I would say, paved the way, created the trust and understanding that paved the way for two historic uh, I would say, uh, boundary agreements, the land boundary agreement and the maritime uh, boundary, both of which were resolved uh, uh, in that period of time. And I would say uh, this is a legacy which comes down from 1947 and 1974 when the Mujib-Indira agreement was signed, but there were issues that persisted and it's only in 2015 uh, when Prime Minister Modi visited Bangladesh that these uh, uh, issues were fully uh, resolved. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, we've had, if you look at the fact that in the last year alone, we had the visits of the President, Prime Minister, and External Affairs Minister of India to Bangladesh in, in a single year, I think that, again, is, is, uh, is a characteristic of the unique ties that our two countries, and closeness of ties that our two countries enjoy. And uh, as Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina is expected to visit here uh, in the next couple of weeks, I think this is a very useful opportunity for us to take stock of where we are and where we could go. Uh, I know there is a shortage of time, but I'll just give you a few examples of what we have done. Uh, one, of course, is that uh, before 1965, a number of trains used to run between our two countries. Most of those links have been restored. Today, you can have trains that go from Kolkata to Dhaka, uh, Dhaka to Khulna. And uh, uh, before 1965, there used to be a train that was called the Darjeeling Mail, which used to go the shortest distance uh, to Darjeeling or to Siliguri was through Bangladesh. Uh, and of course, uh, I never experienced that, but I know that we had to come to the Faraka Barrage, cross the ferry, and then take another train. But if you had that access to Bangladesh, that wouldn't have been necessary. And I'm happy to say that with the Mitali Express being uh, inaugurated earlier this year, you have uh, a line, a train that takes you on a daily basis from Dhaka to New Jalpaiguri. And I think that is also quite incredible in terms of connectivity. And in principle, you can take a train uh, that will go from Kolkata right to Agartala through Bangladesh. And I think uh, connectivity is something that is, rail connectivity is something that is uh, one of the major accomplishments of this uh, uh, economic, uh, I would say, uh, development that, has, that the two countries have witnessed. We have, of course, uh, in terms of bus services, you can take buses from Dhaka to Agartala, to Gauhati, to Shillong. Uh, I think it's a great... A way to facilitate people-to-people -people ties. Uh, you can, um, in principle, uh, you know, take an inland waterways uh, barge all the way from Guwahati to Varanasi after the dredging that has been done in sections of this river that was not used since, I think, 47, I would say, or not after 65 at any rate. So this is also quite unique when inland waterways is being seen increasingly as the most, one of the very economical ways of transportation the restoration of Indian waterway ties, waterways ties between Assam and Bangladesh, Tripura and Bangladesh, and of course, West Bengal and Bangladesh is something very unique in the annals of our cooperation. For the first time, we had uh, a framework agreement on defense that was signed in 2017. 
We had the first visit of an Indian Defense Minister to Bangladesh in 2017. We also signed a $500 million line of credit for Indian defense equipment to be supplied to Bangladesh. And you would have seen last year that for the first time a tri-services Bangladeshi contingent uh, participated in our Republic Day Parade and an Indian contingent participated in Bangladesh National Day Parade in December last year. So this is again um, is uh, you know reflective of the very unique ties that have been accomplished uh, between our two countries. What is the impact of this? Because this is uh, obviously uh, something that we have to do uh, in that 10-minute uh, uh, slot that we have. One, of course, is the remarkable impact this has had on our border infrastructure, on our connectivity, economic integration. South Asia is regarded as the least economically integrated region uh, in the world. And our integration with Bangladesh, as with our other neighbors under the neighborhood first policy, which Ambassador Vijay Thakur Singh spoke about, I think is, is, is a, a very prime, uh, uh, I would say, illustration of what two countries can do to make a difference in the lives of their people. Uh, Bangladesh has emerged as India's fifth largest trading partner. I think this is a very less known fact, but the fact, but it is, uh, I think, a reflection again of the growing trade between our two countries, which has been facilitated by good economic policies on both sides, development of very significant border infrastructure, strong connectivity, and most important of all, removal of uh, any non-tariff and other barriers that had been there between our two countries. Um, India is the only country in Asia where Bangladesh's, Bangladesh's exports have reached $2 billion. I think that's also significant. And, uh, and I would say that, uh, you know, we have realized the potentials of our people-to-people -people contacts through easier access uh, to visas. Uh, I remember in 2016, we were giving 5 lakh visas. Today, we give 18 lakh visas a year. Uh, and that does facilitate uh, business, uh, tourism. Uh, and other uh, medical-related travel, um, and a lot of other initiatives. Education has been an important one. Health has been an important one. You've seen the Oxygen Express trains that have run from India to Bangladesh during the COVID times, the supply of vaccines to Bangladesh and the vaccine Maitri, all a part of our people-to-people -people connect. What are the steps that the two sides can take that would uh, continue to make that difference in the relationship? I think one is, which is very important, is a focus on the priorities of the young people of both our countries. I mean, we have both young nations, uh, you know, and uh, the average age is, is, is uh, in between the 20s and 30s. Uh, we could focus on areas like startups. We could focus on artificial intelligence. Uh, we could look at venture capital funding into our countries. Uh, UPI is already something that is being introduced. FinTech, Internet of Things essentially anything that can benefit the younger people of our two countries. Uh, there, is a, there is talk of uh, a, you know, a conclusion of a comprehensive economic partnership agreement. Uh, according to the joint feasibility study uh, reports that are emerging, uh, this can make a huge difference to our economies. Our exports into each other's countries could increase by 190%. Uh, Bangladesh's GDP could go up by 1.72%, it seems, and India's GDP would also go up. Um, and of course, uh, people of the two countries would greatly benefit. We need to work more on our rivers, joint flood management, pollution control. We need to work on joint uh, boundaries, joint forest uh, reserves that both of us have, the Sundarbans, there are other areas. Joint management of these reserves would be, I think, a very good step forward. How do you work on fisheries and protection of fisheries uh, stocks in our countries? Um, sub third party supply of power from Nepal and Bhutan to Bangladesh has been facilitated by a new power trade agreement. Uh, and I think this will be also something that we will see greater flows from these countries into India, India to Bangladesh. Uh, so the hydroelectric potential is there. Drawing a line from Bangladesh, a transmission line through Bangladesh into India would enable um, the, uh, I would say, uh, evacuation of hydropower from India's northeast, which has surplus hydropower uh, and that will also facilitate supply of power to Bangladesh. Incidentally, we already supply power from the east and west of India, 1140 megawatts to be precise, and enhance cooperation on regional organizations that both our countries have been seminal in creating, that is BIMSTEC and the BBI, and Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal. Uh, these uh, regional and sub-regional constructs are very, very critical to the management of resources between our countries, enhance private sector investments from bo into both countries. I think this is another thing. Of course, we could go on, uh, but I think more important is uh, listening to Shahid, 
Bangladesh's story is a remarkable story of growth and development. And I think Bangladesh's foreign policy reflects that. So we look forward to hearing from, uh, from the person who I think is best qualified to do it. So Shahid, uh, can I invite you to, to uh, inform us all on the subject? Thank you. This one. This one. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador Hirsch, uh, Ambassador uh, Vijay Thakur Singh, and Director General of uh, Indian Council of World Affairs, uh, distinguished uh, gathering, excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm extremely happy, delighted, and privileged to be able to speak in front of you on a on a subject which I normally don't talk. We always talk about relations. But this time, I've been asked uh, <laughs> asked uh, uh, to talk on policy. Uh, so I, I will, I'll, I'll do that. But let me also, uh, with deep sense of uh, sadness, remember, this is the month of August. Uh, our uh, father of the nation, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, uh, along with most of his family members were assassinated on 15th of August. Uh, only two persons survived because they were out uh, of Bangladesh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina and, uh, and Sheikh Rihanna. <clears throat> so uh, it's, uh, it's indeed a uh, uh, very uh, uh, sad month, uh, and we pay uh, tribute to uh, the father of the nation. <clears throat> so with that, I start. Uh, before I... Uh, uh, before I do that, uh, let me also thank uh, the Director General for giving me the opportunity. Uh, my, my title is, as you know, Bangladesh's foreign policy. So we will be looking at the policy rather than on the relation, as I said. Now, let me also share with you as to how I see policy, uh, foreign policy. Foreign policy is a set of guidelines and strategies which are designed and implemented to build relations and to help a country manage its international politics. So you, you'll see that rather than the nitty gritty of the relationship. So that's one I, I thought I will I'll share before I go on to that. Uh, I, I tried to sort of uh, base my uh, presentation on a couple of assumptions, which, is, which, which are essential uh, for uh, looking at the policy of a young country. Uh, Bang Bangladesh or uh, Bengal is a part of a larger, bigger Indian civilization. So when we are talking about Bangladesh, it's 50 years old, but it has a history, goes back to thousands and thousands of years, which is much more integrated with the Indian uh, civilization. So that's, that's where I come from. Uh, that's the school of thought I, I belong to. Second is Bangladesh, is 50 years old, relatively young, uh, but the sense of civilization uh, often gets reflected into its nationhood. So that's second. Third is that inhabitant of Bangladesh, uh, the Bengalis, have a strong sense of identity uh, and, uh, and in sense of independence and fiercely uh, freedom-loving people. So I'm sure there are other people, but that's, that's really striking. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to make Bangladesh today. And the last one is that Bang Bengalis and Bangladeshis are also very resilient. And they can, uh, they can stand up uh, time and again uh, to, to get their, uh, their share uh, from whoever has taken it. So I will I'll try and quickly run through uh, four focused areas. One is that quick look at Bangladesh, where Bangladesh stand after 50 years. So that's one. Second is the genesis of the foreign policy, uh, where and how it originated and who were the, uh, who were the mentors. And the uh, third one is that what are the fundamentals, elements, uh, and other things. I haven't tried it before, so, so, so we'll try to see and how it goes. And then uh, look at, uh, as uh, the director general has been sort of uh, provoking me uh, while we are talking a couple of minutes back, what is the future? Uh, in terms of policies, looking at future is dangerous. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, 
I, I, I will try and, uh, and see how it, it, it goes. So, okay. So as I said that I come from a school of thought where I believe that Bangladesh is a part of a bigger Indian civilization because of history, because of politics, because of some mistakes uh, and, uh, a, a, and the rest of it. And the British, we can't uh, uh, but not mention that, uh, created what is uh, currently South Asia, India, and Bangladesh. So that's, that's one part. So that's why I, I thought that you know, when we talk about history of Bangladesh, let's start with the, from the Palas, not, not from the Mughals, but much before that. So that's something uh, I thought I will let you know. But if you, if you talk about Bangladesh, then you have to start with, uh, uh, with the father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, who tried to sort of unite all Bengalis for a cause, for a freedom, for justice against the Pakistani oppression. Okay. So that's that is the war, the 1971 war of liberation is a is a very um, difficult, distressing, but at the same time very uh, inspiring event. So, uh, so that's uh, uh, that's something uh, we we need to keep in mind. And with this, we saw Bangladesh. Bangladesh is also very strategically located. I'm not talking about Bengal. I'm talking about Bangladesh. So that that something uh, uh, is is critically uh, important. Okay. So this is some of the pictures. Just to remind that uh, when you talk about the Bangladesh foreign policy, you just cannot start saying that these are the elements, these are its dimensions, rather than looking at history, culture, tradition, and identity. So that's what I I I, I did. Uh, I see it's going back. Okay, where we stand, Bangladesh is uh, economically, I think, doing pretty good compared to what we were in 1971. Uh, our per capita income was uh, $80. Uh, now it is uh, $2,420 as of today. So it's, it's doing quite good. I will, uh, I will skip that uh, compared to even some of the regional countries. And you see, also history of resilience. When we were liberated, uh, and I still remember I was hardly, what, eight, nine years old kid, and uh, uh, I, I sort of uh, could not realize that in nine months' time why uh, my uh, parents could not put on three square meals on the table. What that went wrong? For a young kid, it was very difficult because uh, I came from a pretty well of family, and we struggled because there was... There was nothing in the field. We lost three crops to start with. We had we had nothing. The Pakistanis made sure that uh, and that after they leave, you all die. So, if that's the intention of the occupying force, this is what actually happens. It is something I'm speaking from my own experience, which I have seen. It's not history. It's not book. It is my own uh, understanding as a young kid. So. The father of the nation came back and we, we decided that we're going to make a pretty good case, whatever uh, is, is, the, uh, is the need of the hour. And as of today, we see despite our limitations, we have done fairly weak. I'm, I'm quickly coming to on the foreign policy. Now, this is a very uh, interesting collage. Uh, and I, I use it uh, for my students in the university. Uh, and, and give them an exercise to explain what this collage contains. I will not going to do that here, but I can tell you it will. It talks about a very rich Bangladesh, both economically, socially, and culturally, and that's what it captures. Each, if you go to the each point, you'll see it is something very unique about Bangladesh and Bengal, and in the center, it is our father of the nation. So this is what the foreign policy thinks that I'm talking about. Let's look at the foreign policy. Now, you know, if you go back to the history and talk about Bangladesh's foreign policy, very initial phases, and I had the opportunity to serve under some of those who have really been in the forefront of uh, 
uh, of uh, putting the flag onto the uh, onto the earth of Bangladesh. That uh, and that uh, uh, you you cannot but um, thank the Indian government because the genesis of the foreign policy of Bangladesh were in uh, India. So it was started off in 6th April 1971, New Delhi, yeah, when some of our uh, Bengali diplomats decided enough is enough, we are not going to serve any more the Pakistanis, we'll have our own country hopefully one day and we will start laying the bricks for the foreign policy. So that was the beginning of the foreign policy. So Bangladesh's foreign policy hasn't uh, been decided uh, on a table or in a blackboard or in a book. It was actually started on the road of Delhi and Calcutta and then got linked with the field where our freedom fighters were giving their life for independence. So that's the uh, that's the uh, roots of the of the foreign policy. Now, if you do not go into that, you really do not understand where from the spirit of Bangladesh's foreign policy should must come from. And that is why, when I come back later, you will see that in our foreign policy there are certain elements which are overwhelmingly sometimes you will feel maybe not not that necessary focuses on the whole issue of starvation, distress, talks about uh, inequality, talks about uh, vulnerability, more than a foreign policy should possibly talk about. So, uh, and the is because of this particular experience that our senior had who passed on this uh, to us. Uh, Bangabandhu, after uh, uh, almost uh, coming to uh, or facing his death, came back from Pakistan jail. And one of the first thing he did in London uh, is one of his, uh, on the right hand, you'll see the press conference that he's doing. He said, no, we are a young nation, please recognize us. So history of Bangladesh's foreign policy is asking for recognition as a state. And at that time, we had very few uh, uh, countries who recognized Bangladesh, despite the fact that we jointly defeated uh, the Pakistanis and, and they, were, uh, they were about to leave uh, Bangladesh. Uh, but some of the countries were not uh, convinced that this is a country which should get a recognition as a sovereign independent state. So the history and uh, I had the privilege of looking at some of the initial, uh, uh, initial records of, of that era that what our seniors were writing uh, to various countries seeking, uh, uh, seeking um, uh, <clears throat> seeking uh, recognition on behalf. So that's the beginning. On, on the left, uh, that is uh, New York, uh, because in 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 seventy one, uh, our seniors decided that we will start our campaign, New York and India. So multilateral and bi bilateral, and that sense of multilateralism, this importance of multilateralism for a small vulnerable country, continue to remain in the fabric of Bangladesh's foreign policy, which we'll see later. Okay, so what are the fundamentals? There's two fundamental documents that uh, one should look at. Uh, because, you know, when there was a crackdown by the Pakistani forces on 25th of March in 1971, Bangladesh, uh, uh, the then Bangladesh political leaders decided, in fact, they were all elected MPs of National Assembly of Pakistan. So they all went to Meherpur, one of the districts of Bangladesh bordering India, and declared uh, Bangladesh's uh, 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 independence. Uh, and in, in the independent document on 10th April, it's, it committed Bangladesh to the international peace uh, and uh, cooperation and to the UN. So that was the beginning of the foreign policy of Bangladesh. When we got liberated, and we, we, we had our first constitution. Our constitution, Article 25, actually is the raison d'etre of our foreign policy. So, and it talks about uh, basically uh, non-interference, uh, settlement of inter 
national dispute by uh, negotiations and also committed fully to the charter of the united nations so that's the article 25 now our constitution is also very interesting because it is based on four pillars okay? socialism remember 71 we were we just came out of a cold war bangladesh is possibly the only child state came out of a cold war and it continued to uh, be a uh, issue in the cold war i'm reminding you of nixon's visit or kissinger's visit to china uh, and uh, and some of the other things uh, that were happening in those days so uh, so that's that's uh, that's very uh, important uh, and because that will also uh, determine subsequent policy moves so when the father of the nation came back now he I, i'm sure that and and some of the documents that that we see struggled what should be the uh, fundamentals of the bangladesh policy should we uh, be tilted towards soviet bloc or tilted towards western bloc the american led bloc and he decided that we will not tilt to anyone we will be non aligned and uh, you know when i say that bangladesh at that stage um, announced that bangladesh should continue to follow the policy of non alignment it wasn't an easy decision because our neighbor also had a similar policy but there was a larger tilt of india towards a particular block is is history but bangladesh decided not to tilt to anyone having understood that america did not recognize china did not recognize till 1974 75 so that's that's the um, that's the challenge that uh, that uh, we faced uh, in those days uh, he was very clear he went to the i'm, I'm meaning the bangabandhu he went to non aligned movement to un and said that look we are a small country he literally said a small country which i think we no longer use that terminology because we are in no way small looking at uh, looking at our economy which is 500 billion uh, and looking at our populations uh, so that's one and, but he said we are a small country uh, and uh, we want to have friendship with all and malice towards none and we'll coexist in the world so he was he was coming from a different plane uh, all together uh, and uh, but he was at the same time very strong in terms of making sure that people understand what bengalis went through and i will i'll read this para for you which he uh, said in the unga first uh, the only assembly that he could attend he said bengali people is not calling bangladeshi people very interesting he said bengali people have fought over the centuries that's why i say we are a part of a civilization so that they may secure for themselves the right to live in freedom and with dignity as a free citizens of a free country they have aspired to live in peace and friendly with all nations in the world so very strong sense of civilization and the and the sense of justice that he was coming uh, out uh, in the initial stage now and that continues to be the fundamentals of the bangladesh's foreign policy as of today uh, these are some of the markers i will not go into details as to uh, when uh, uh, we joined what uh, and uh, and this is uh, also uh, uh, i will i will leave if anybody is interested the phases of uh, our uh, foreign policy making uh, we started off uh, looking at our independence recognition as part of our foreign policy and eventually uh, i think by now we have um, been recognized as a country which can take care of itself uh, it has created its own model of development uh, you know uh, I'll, i'll just share something with you which will capture uh, uh, the sense of achievement that we have made over the years uh, there was a director world bank first director world bank to bangladesh uh, and uh, and uh, uh, and he made a very strong comment he wrote a book afterwards that if bangladesh makes it then any country will make it if bangladesh makes it any country will make it that means bangladesh will not make it 
So we all know now that Bangladesh is 38th largest economy in the world. And the trajectory suggests that it will certainly go further into the serial. <coughs> so that uh, now, in terms of strength and limitation of the foreign policy, this normally we, we elaborate, I will not elaborate. What is the geographical location? Demography, very strong demography. We have a very young population and we, we think that another 30, 35 years will enjoy the demographic dividend. Uh, so that's second. Economy is fairly good uh, and uh, $500 billion, much better than Pakistan. Uh, who who left us behind, uh, uh, you know, uh, in in distress. Um, in terms of connectivity, uh, you know, if you look at the map, Bangladesh plays a very pivotal role in connectivity. In fact, the way British divided Bengal it was very pathetic, because they make sure the northeast region, which is the most thriving region in, before 1947, which was creating much more wealth than <laughs> some part of uh, India gets shattered after the leave. So they put the, the East Bengal and East Pakistan into a place where it gets absolutely disconnected. The Northeast region was disconnected uh, till 1971 from the rest of the world, except the chicken neck, which was very difficult. So that's why Bangladesh plays a very strategic uh, uh, place in terms of getting this part of the uh, economy thriving, especially the northeast region. Uh, the other day I was in the northeast in the Shillong and I see the enthusiasm and I, I went around that area, uh, the Gohati, Shillong and other places. I realized that northeast region, Bangladesh and the Bay of Bengal together can bring back the stories of British and pre-British economy of that region. It is huge possibilities because there are every kind of a potentials that's there. And actually, Bangladesh and uh, India is looking towards that future. Uh, the first thing, if you look at the future, you have to believe in it, even if it is something not there. That's all the father of the nation said. You may not have a land, you may not have a freedom, but first believe in it. Once you believe in it, you get it, and then works towards it. So, so that's this. The defense forces, we have a defense force which is not aggressive, which is not up against any country, but which is part of the development story. So that's something we need to do. And when I, when I say that, I have a strong feeling that, that there are issues centering around that particular uh, strength of the foreign policy. But so far, we have been very lucky to make sure that they continue to remain a positive force in the development of Bangladesh, not the way they have behaved in 1975 and afterwards. Good. What are the limitations of our foreign policy? The first limitation is the climate change. The climate change affects Bangladesh very badly, and I'll show you part of it. Second, which we never thought we'll have to face, is the rise of violent extremism and fundamentalism. In fact, in 1971, we thought that once for all, we have decided, we have, we have settled in terms of our identity, in terms of our uh, affiliation, but that's not the case. The 2% of the population who did not believe in Bangladesh was still around. And this is also uh, very uh, sad that Bhagavandu decided that you know, these people are Bangladeshi, they are Bengali, they have the right to live in Bangladesh. But at the end, he gave his life for that particular decision. There were 336 uh, collaborators, I, we call them, uh, were in the jail. In 1975, after the assassination of Bangabandhu, those were released. And those people continue to remain in our society and create all kinds of violence and extremism. I'm sure there will be one or two questions on that. The very recent issues, the uh, presence of Rohingyas, but we have 1.2 million uh, of Rohingyas on our land. It's a huge burden. It's not a burden in terms of economic burden, but it is also 
a burden in terms of stability. These people are actually um, occupying an area which has always been very uh, unstable. It is uh, very close to northeast particular region, Bangladesh and Myanmar. That area has always been very vulnerable. That's why we are extremely concerned that any kind of a uh, situation with the Rohingyas could unstable the whole region, including China, because it's very close to the Chinese border. Good. So there's the limitations. Uh, in terms of elements, you know, safeguarding uh, sovereignty, territorial integrity, security, and national interest is very core of any country. So it's it's there. I thought it putting on the top rather than on the uh, uh, on the bottom. Uphold values of our war of liberations. We continue to struggle in terms of making our policies align with the values of 1971. Uh, peace, stability, national interests, pragmatism, humanitarianism. That's why we have hosted Rohingyas because we remember that uh, uh, some of our forefathers had to take shelter in 1971 in India. And had the Indian didn't give us shelter, we possibly wouldn't have been here today. So that's something always haunts us, uh, especially the generation which has seen that. Uh, and then uh, we also try and build alliances and allies moving out of the traditional alliance systems. How much time do we have, madam? Okay, I'll go quick. Um, now, in terms of we have the foreign policy, now what is the course of action? We, we think that uh, we have to be proactive. We cannot remain inactive um, in terms of uh, uh, all our activities, including the peacekeeping uh, 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 role, uh, hub of connectivity, business. And the other one is the Bay of Bengal. We have started rethinking uh, the, uh, the role of Bay of Bengal in our foreign policy. Uh, we, 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 we are land-bound people. We, we born, die on the land. So we often feel that that's where the future is, but never think that the future could also be in the seas and the, in, in the oceans. So there's a major shift in our foreign policy uh, lately in, 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 in terms of that. Now, I will share with you uh, something uh, which I am in the process of writing, that what is the... Um, what is the theoretical basis of Bangladesh's foreign policy? You know, foreign policy could be explained by many, many ways. But I, I thought we'll take the four lenses, realism, globalism, idealism, which is partly Marxism or new structuralists, and the nationalism. And you, if you put that all the major elements of the four and try and see where Bangladesh foreign policy stands, you'll see that Bangladesh foreign policy has sort of a borrowed or contributed, whichever you... Uh, a call uh, uh, from all the four. From all the four. I'll tell you how. I see that in terms of globalism, the, because Bangabandhu was a globalist, he, he looked uh, outside. He, he wanted uh, to, uh, uh, to join all kinds of, uh, uh, all kinds of uh, organizations. So in terms of globalism, Bangladesh foreign policy uh, borrows all the five components of globalism. I'll not read that out. In terms of realism, we, we struggle. There are two components which feature out in the Bangladesh's foreign policy making. One is the importance of self-reliance. That's, you know, realists believe that you have to stand on your leg. Don't look at uh, others to help you out. And forging alliance with states. So very realist. Huh? Uh, so that's the two. In terms of nationalism, our whole liberation war is based on Bengali nationalism. A nationalism uh, which, which is very progressive, inclusive, and global. Not the, some of the nationalisms that we see in its manifestation today. Because Robi Thakur reminded us that patriotism goes rogue, becomes nationalism. So we have always thought, let's not be a patriotic which will make you an ultra-nationalist, where you'll not see anyone other than your own nation. So, so that's the two. Uh, and in terms of idealism, as you know that uh, because of the Cold War period and because of the people who fought for Bangladesh had a little left-leaning orientation. 
Bengalis are basically leftist. I am sorry to say this. <laughs> if you go to the university, and it was good because that gave the strength to think about future. Um, so that was the ideological basis uh, that we have borrowed from Marxism or idealism. And it gets reflected in our foreign policy uh, making decisions as of today, as of today. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we believe, and you'll see reflection of that in Bangladesh's foreign policy, that Western dominated international system is not that good for the smaller developed in nations. Very clear. It often comes in our exercises. Uh, so uh, if you ask me ex uh, of uh, examples, I can give you 10, but I will not, because those are something not to be shared in public. Good, but I can see the tilt, uh, even at the political level and at the, uh, at the, uh, 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 at the bureaucracy level. Good, uh, I'm coming to an end. Uh, what are the thrust of Bangladesh's foreign policy? I'll go quick. Uh, Trust is peace, development, and multilateralism. Very clear trust everywhere. Uh, I leave whoever is interested to take it. Now, the way we have structured our policy is that you have the peace, you have the development, but it is in the context of multilateralism. And that's how most of our policy articulations are made in various policy places. Now, <clears throat> second thrust, significance of Bangladesh-India relationship is very critical. Bangladesh-India relationship is very critical in our foreign policy making. Now, any government not recognizing that is, I think, is in a deep trouble. It's my own experience that you have to have a very strong uh, feel as to how your neighbor is, uh, is doing things or uh, building its own relationship, because that will affect your own relationship. And that is why Bangabandhu, the, you know, there's this number of relationship that Bangabandhu nurtured himself. One was with India. So he came to Kolkata at the invitation of the then Prime Minister. Uh, and he said, you know, people, the, the uh, what you call the um, journalist asked him, but how would you want to have a relationship with India? He said, our relationship with India, and I'm quoting him, is special relationship. That relationship doesn't have in, with anyone else, number one. Number two, the relationship is eternal. So it is special, it is eternal. That's what he said. And anybody failing to understand that would end up in a difficult situation. So that's second. And, and why? Because Bangladesh can only grow and the Northeast region can only grow, and the Bay of Bengal can only grow when all are in coherence. And that's what Ambassador Hirsch was saying, that we try to sort of bring these various trends and tendencies and issues together to see a, a different India-Bangladesh relationship, which wasn't there. Which wasn't there. Actually, uh, the Pakistani government uh, makes sure that there is no relation with uh, be then East Pakistan with the rest of India. And a very naturally occurring relationship has been destroyed to the detriment of, of all. So that's one. The trust continue to remain on regionalism and connectivity. So second, third. Uh, and then Indo-Pacific. It's a new reality. It's a new trust. We are not sure how to navigate, but we are, we are learning. In our foreign policy articulation, you will see specifics of, of this. I will not go. If there are questions, I'll be very happy. Rohingya issue, as I said, it's a huge burden, not only in terms of economy, but also in terms of stability. Climate change. See, if one meter rise will take away, people say one third of Bangladesh, but I think they exaggerate, it's one-tenth of Bangladesh. So if that happens, it will be huge foreign policy implications. That's why in our foreign policy, the climate change and displacement issue features out very prominently in our foreign policy. In many, many countries, that's not a foreign policy issue. But in our case, it's a foreign policy issue. So that's the thrust. Now, this takes a long time to explain. Bangladesh is the middle of all 
regional alliances that are in the making. One is the Indo-Pacific, second is the Belt and Road Initiative, second in the Eurasia. You know, had we been somewhere else, life would have been a little easier for us in terms of policy making. But we are there in the middle, along with our uh, other colleagues, uh, other countries. And that creates a huge pressure on our foreign policy making. Because that's not relation building, it's a, it's a policy making. And we are still struggling on, uh, on that. I'm coming to an... Uh, I will skip this. Concluding thoughts. Um, now, I think uh, we often talk about credible and a balanced foreign policy. I'm yet to understand and see a credible and balanced foreign policy making when we bring in your national interest into the context and your limitations onto the play. Sometimes the foreign policies are not balanced, not credible. And as a, uh, as a pragmatic nation, we have to uh, live with it. Sometimes that's why we are uh, criticized that some of our policies are not uh, credible or uh, balanced. Uh, the second thought and which I practice myself that when you, when you, you have a new policy making exercise, you try and see how you, your neighbors doing. Because they are also struggling with the same kinds of things. How about an exchange to see how they are building their own uh, foreign policy? That will help you to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to learn from each other. Uh, this is the last uh, thought I will leave with you. I'll, I'll actually read it. Bangladesh in the hands of a new generation. Energetic, entrepreneurial, and highly motivated to build a new Bangladesh. Now this is unless and until you live in Bangladesh, you would not feel it. As envisioned by our father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. I often struggle when I interact with my younger generation. They see the world and Bangladesh from absolutely a different angle. And they, I think, they often feel that or, or, or suggest that we have failed them. We could have done better. Bangladesh could have done better in every sense of the word, in terms of governance, in terms of economics, in terms of its image, which we could not. Now, I leave it to you to decide, but I feel they are right. We possibly, in 50 years, could have done better, also in terms of our foreign policy. We lost huge time and space just because our leaders could not decide which way to go. But that's a challenge that we'll continue to face in future. But our next generation will bring a different Bangladesh for us. Thank you very much. The floor is now open for question and answers. I would request Ambassador Stringler to moderate the discussion. It was to listen to Shahid uh, speak about Bangladesh's foreign policy so comprehensively, right from its historic evolution to the priorities and challenges and the theoretical underpinnings that uh, I would say guide foreign policy. And of course, concluding with uh, the fact that you know Bangladesh is a young country like India, and it's the youth that have the highest aspirations and expectations of any. Uh, you know, foreign policy uh, that a country can operate. And, and of course, uh, I think the expectations are always, uh, you know, more than what uh, the system is able to deliver. And uh, it, it is all the more reason to strive harder and work harder. But uh, let's uh, open up uh, the floor to any questions. Uh, I know that you may want to pose. Uh, yeah, I think the gentleman in the back. Thank you, sir, for the excellent presentation on Bangladesh foreign policy. Uh, sir, towards the end of uh, your presentation, you uh, very briefly referred to China's Belt and Road Initiative. I have a very small question on that. Uh, many experts now argue uh, that in the process of implementation of uh, 
Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, China also interferes in domestic and foreign affairs of recipient country directly or indirectly. We are also aware of some controversies in uh, Bangladesh. Uh, would you like to uh, share your experience as far as Bangladesh is concerned and especially how it is perceived at go government and popular levels? Thank you, sir. Shall we take the yeah, I think we'll take a few more. Uh, there were some. Uh, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> sir, I have two, uh, two questions. Uh, recently, uh, Sheikh Hasina uh, said that uh, she fears similar threat to her life, uh, what her uh, father fears. So who are these people uh, presenting threat to her? And uh, what kind of role do they play in the foreign policy making of Bangladesh? Do they have any influence even now? That is one. And second, India is trying to build a, a regional security architecture uh, in the form of uh, Colombo con uh, conclave in that Sri Lanka, you know, and Maldives are uh, part. So uh, do you think Bangladesh also joining India in some kind of security architecture? Because uh, uh, both India and Bangladesh, you know, they are middle income countries and they spend huge amount of money. Uh, you must be aware 2030 forces program of uh, Bangladesh. Uh, one question is, uh, what is the objective of uh, this uh, uh, program? Forces 2030. Uh, I think that's uh, three or four questions. So <laughs> I'd like to give everybody a chance, but don't mind. Next, uh, who's got a question? Yeah, uh, just after that, man. Yeah. Um, so my question is from a historical perspective. Of course, like any uh, you know newly independent country, um, Bangladesh has witnessed the evolution of democracy, and it has seen many phases. Of course, we can now see a more consolidated position regarding that. So, um, sir, how would you say that has affected Bangladesh's foreign policy in terms of how, um, let's say, you've advocated for democracy throughout the world? I think uh, let's have the last question from. I was in Bangladesh after 10 years of its independence to do my doctoral work in the Manikganj Thana. So I had a very beautiful experience. But that's not what I'm going to ask. You know, we had a system of uh, Srihatta Somailan here, which High Commissioner Moazza Mali, your previous, uh, the High Commissioner previously before you came, he used to always arrange uh, Srihatta get togethers. And he said in Kolkata, because my father was born in Silet. He said, in Kolkata, when we are having a next meeting, I have to invite you. And you have to become a young member. So uh, not young, but member. And, um, and so that never happened. Unfortunately, he passed away. So are you going to continue that three hotel Sommelan meetings? Shall, shall we? You have your work cut out for you, Shahid. Yeah. Go right ahead. No, I think you could. I think uh, let, let, let me let me try and uh, you know get these answers first, and then we'll come back uh, once again. Um, thank you very much for the for your question and uh, for uh, remembering that uh, Sir Mohsen Malisar is not with us. I was I had the privilege of being his uh, director. So I, I I've seen him very closely. It's very unfortunate. Uh, I I think this he had to get together is a, is a kind of a regular phenomena. Uh, and I, I think it should go ahead. I was in Shillong. Uh, I also faced the, this question. Uh, uh, so I will, I will try and um, sort of uh, put this uh, uh, question uh, where it needs to be. Uh, we will be having a new High Commissioner coming in on 1st of October. It's normally uh, the High Commissioner here and the, uh, and the High Commissioner in Dhaka jointly sort of uh, does it, but it's more uh, at a people's level, uh, uh, Silong, Gohati, and uh, and Silet, uh, and also West Bengal. So I, I'll, I I'm I'm taking a note, and I'll I'll do whatever could be could be done. It's a pe part of the people's to people contact that that we are talking about, and I have been uh, to that border uh, from the Indian side. I've been there from the Bangladesh side before, and I I saw how close it is actually, uh, the whole area. But thank you. Uh, on the issue of uh, democracy and foreign policy, uh, in fact, uh, there, is, there is a saying that the foreign policy and the domestic policy goes hand by hand. So your national domestic politics will have an influence on your foreign policy. 
and we have seen in our part of uh, um, Bangladesh in 1975 when Bangabandhu was assassinated, the military took over, they had changed the course of the Bangladesh foreign policy. It was very clear. Uh, course has been um, reversed, uh, but in between, a lot of damage has been done. Uh, uh, and, uh, and we see the fallout of that uh, continue to haunt Bangladesh's foreign policy. So my uh, answer is, of course, it, it depends on who is in, in power, who is maneuvering the uh, domestic politics. Uh, it will have an impact on the foreign policy. Foreign policy cannot be disconnected from the, from the domestic policy. Uh, that's true for Bangladesh. In, in terms of a, a, a threat and uh, insecurity and instability, uh, I think Bangladesh have seen a difficult period, uh, not once, two, three times, where uh, the political stability was, uh, 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 was disturbed, um, leading to a bigger uh, uh, sort of a instability in Bangladesh. And uh, uh, certainly, uh, we, we are aware of it. Uh, the Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina is also aware of it. Uh, but I think, uh, you, know, if, you know, if you ask me personally, and I'm not a civilian, so I can, I can say that. I think we have Bangladesh as a, as a country and a society has moved far away from 1975. In 1975, three, four disgruntled, derailed, army officer could go and kill father of the nation and got away with it. I don't think that would be possible anymore in Bangladesh. It's a different Bangladesh that you have to remember. We are not in that stage. I don't see that possibility myself because the people wouldn't allow it. So that's, that's something. Uh, and, and that's why I say that Bangladesh is in the hand of a new generation. And that what we, we have seen very recently, I think Hashim, you were there, no? When uh, the, uh, um, uh, the uh, what do you call? Holy uh, Bakery. Huh? The, uh, Holy Bakery. Yep, Holy Bakery event and the rest of it. People stood up and said that, you know, this is not on. It, it cannot continue. But you have to also remember that when we were fighting our struggle, that 2% of the population did not believe in Bangladesh. They did not thought and that uh, Bangladesh should uh, fight for its independence. And those two persons are still around. We have seen a reflection of that in the last <coughs> election, about 4.6%. I'm talking about uh, the faith-based uh, people or faith-based political uh, uh, parties. So they are there, uh, but that's the beauty of politics, you know. You have to uh, get all kinds of people uh, uh, under a system where uh, they would not be able to do a damage which they tried in the past and they will again try in future, but the government has to take the people and fight it. The government cannot fight it alone. In terms of a uh, uh, threat, the radical threat that you are talking about, the Colombo uh, uh, enclave, uh, I, I will I'll tell you the Bangladesh foreign policy uh, as of now, uh, because of um, uh, friendship with all and malice towards none, decided that Bangladesh will join any alliance, any, take any ally, as long as it serves the economic objective interest of the country. One, it would not join any alliance, anyone, or any individual country if it is in the area of defense and military. So there is a nuanced difference between Bangladesh and some of the other countries where we have avoided being party to any alliances which has a, 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 a tenet of uh, defense and military. So we are still there. Uh, we haven't made a major deviation on that. Uh, whether Bangladesh should be able to keep that uh, or not, uh, time will only suggest. But if you look at uh, uh, the uh, fluid situation that our Madam Director General has been mentioning, uh, would that allow countries to uh, remain uh, away from uh, defense and security pacts or not? Who knows? But as of now, that's not the policy of the government.
did i answer it in a roundabout manner okay. there's there's another another question the first question actually the china china's chinese bri you know we also look at uh, the chinese bri china's bri or uh, or in the pacific through the same angle that i just mentioned that as long as it serves bangladesh's economic interests we are willing to go with it but at the same time we know what to take and what not to take i'll give you an example there are there are a number of projects which are currently on hold because subsequently bangladesh realized that these will not serve uh, the economic interest of bangladesh and those are uh, unlikely to pass through those are bri projects some not all number one uh, number two I, i think we you need to have a confidence on bangladesh government of bangladesh can uh, sort of a take forward its own um, mega projects so far with his own money and the best example is our uh, podda bridge so it has given a confidence that we can not only finance we can also manage a project like podda bridge which was not an easy project and and this will also influence the future projects both in terms of our financing and in terms of our managing uh, and you'll see more and more we'll try and do things independent of uh some of these uh, uh um, countries where they have uh, a possibly a hidden motive behind uh taking on larger bigger pictures we'll see but we are very careful i can uh, sitting here i can think of one two three projects which which went through even the parliament we are subsequently scrapped i am talking about the bri project so Have faith in Bangladesh and the people of Bangladesh. Yeah. Thank we you. Have, we have time for another quick round. Just, just two questions, uh, Manish. Uh, sir, by and large, uh, Ambassador Hak, uh, welcome to India. Uh, by and large, India-Bangladesh relations are on an upward trajectory. You know, uh, talking about the forthcoming visit of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. Uh, what do you what is your broad expectation what are the next big steps which we can expect to come out of this visit thank you and there is a question from lady right in front of you sir basra uh thank you ambassador hug for your lucid presentation i couldn't help but notice the focus on migration which is very apparent in bangladesh's foreign policy given that migration is usually considered an issue of low politics Uh, how do you explain bangladesh clear cut focus in its foreign policy on migration issues apart from the obvious reasons of climate change and the geopolitical situation secondly given the leadership role bangladesh has on many international fora on migration how is it ensuring that the voices of the global south is heard at the international forums thank you good so thank you uh, on the issue of uh, I'll, i'll take the issue Uh, visit issue later uh, uh, let me take on the migration that's my subject that's my passion uh, on this uh, but uh, the issue of migration especially on the international migration uh, is a big foreign policy ticket uh, in our country now bangladesh has played a very vital role in the area of migration international migration as you know that bangladesh uh, has uh, been the chair of the global forum on migration and development which is the global norm setting Uh, uh exercise uh because of bangladesh egypt philippine mexico brazil this five country led a huge movement to bring migration into the international regime because it was not part of the un so that's way bangladesh continue to pioneer in that uh, uh so so uh, to conclude that uh migration is a foreign policy issue in in bangladesh it has always been actually uh i'll stop here i'll not uh lead myself into another area uh, which uh, maybe at another day we will we'll have a discussion because when i was in the northeast region i was confronted with that uh, with that question and i'm being an international migration uh, person 
I have absolutely a different uh, look uh, or analysis of regional migration, which not essentially goes with the Bangladesh policy making uh, process. And because I, I, I have written, uh, I have a book on that, so, uh, so that's my angle. But I think this is one area that Bangladesh and India need to look at very closely to build a much better, stronger relationship. You cannot for long just avoid it thinking that it's not there. This will hurt long-term relationship of the two countries. Now I know there is a huge apprehension from both sides, but uh, I think our younger generation have more guts and courage to take on difficult issues in terms of relationship and that's essential. Okay, on the issue of our Prime Minister's visit, uh, I'm very optimistic, I'm always optimistic, I'm, I'm, I'm dead optimistic on, on any uh, uh, visits because uh, that often, uh, and despite all limitations, brings something good. And we have uh, a, a situation where the two leaders are very comfortable, very friendly, very warm. Uh, and that's what makes the visit successful. And I've seen it myself. So, you know, system, yes, we have a very warm relationship. We work very closely at all levels, but at the end, it, it matters is the relationship between the two leaders because they often end up solving many problems which for years the civil service just cannot, the bureaucrats cannot, the foreign office cannot. I've, I've seen it myself, I'm sure. <laughs> Harsh has seen it because it has happened during during our time that we have been struggling, pulling our hair, thinking that you know the uh, the uh, uh, the the heaven on or hell will fall on our head, and then realize in one second the problem was solved by the two leaders, and then we struggle as to how we pick up the pieces <laughs> and try to create a structure out of it. So so that's where, where it is. I think uh, this time after after a long break it will be a very good. Uh, visit as I see initially, especially on the issues of um, Ushiara River, which has been pending for quite, uh, quite some time. And also uh, SEPA, which is the uh, Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, uh, which will go in a full force. I think, I think we have come to a level in terms of trade investment uh, that uh, you know, it, with this uh, structure between the two countries, it cannot further uh, the way it has done in other uh, areas. So we need a more comprehensive understanding and an agreement so that uh, our business people, our peop our general people could uh, sort of a rip benefit of, of that. And so some of the, um, some of the pro provisions that's there need to go and some new provisions has to come in given the uh, global trade and investment regimes uh, going through, especially on the on the supply chain, regional supply chain issues, because we have realized that we cannot wait something to come from all the way from Latin America for producing something because the ships are not running, the the uh, the uh, the planes are not flying. So we have realized that we have to have those uh, uh, things coming from the neighborhood at least possible, both way. So that's uh, uh, something uh, uh, important. I'm very optimistic. I think uh, the visit would be a very good. Uh, 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 and, and a successful visit. Uh, uh, what will feature out? I think it will feature out uh, water, uh, not in terms of uh, only uh, um, uh, distribution, but in terms of water resources development. I think there, there needs to be a shift and that we just cannot talk about which percentage, but we have to take what we do with the water. That's something uh, need to come. I think, uh, uh, the issue of uh, border mobility and uh, connectivity has to team up. You cannot talk about connectivity unless you talk about border management and uh, people's mobility, because connectivity at a higher level is people's mobility. We have seen it that in Europe. We have seen that in Africa. So possibly uh, and that that could uh, that could gradually come in so that we start uh, doing early because connectivity. Yes, but it has limitations up to a certain level. If you take it further, it has to bring the whole issue of border management and mobility issues onto the platform. Uh, but I'm very, I'm very optimistic because the equation between the two leaders are excellent. So that will solve some of our uh, problems which uh, 
which normally trip up in the, uh, uh, on the table for the, for the bureaucracy. Thank you. So I think the last two questions are particularly fitting because uh, Shahid has uh, special experience on both. Uh, he has been a senior uh, official in the International Organization on Migration, one of the leading authorities on migration on a global level. Uh, but he's also, I think, uh, overseen two visits of Prime Minister Sheikh, two past visits of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina to India, 2017 and 19, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And uh, so, um, you know, giving you a sense of the forthcoming visit, uh, I think, uh, would be something that would be definitely up his sleeve. Um, very, very grateful. Thanks to you, Shahid, for sharing your perspective of Bangladesh's foreign policy, something that I think hasn't been really discussed before. And we have, uh, I think, a special a privileged uh, advantage in having the chair of the Bangu Bandhu, um, you know, studies uh, in Delhi University with us and uh, his uh, perspective on foreign policy is uh, the best that you can get. Um, uh, thank you very much uh, um, to Director General uh, Vijay Thakur Singh and her colleagues for organizing this and of course thanks to all of you for your interest in the subject and for bearing with us uh, for all this time. So thank you. Have a great evening. Uh, with this, we come to the end of the program. I would thank everyone for participating in the event. I would request everyone to join us for Haiti in the foyer. Thank you. Oh, yeah, no, no, no.